This episode is scripted by John Ruths and Newell Fisher and is narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 36 in which we will be going through chapter 36, Approaching Thunder. Today is the 5th of November, a significant date in the UK but all the more so in Lewis where we are moving shortly. Tonight my wife and I will process the streets of the town in costume as part of the massive celebrations in Lewis. The entire event didn't happen last year due to Covid. Let's hope it passes safely this year. Before we move on to today's chapter, I've had an email from Tom concerning the origin of Rabbit Legends, which is worth reading out in full. He writes, quote, Because of your podcast, I'm rereading Watership Down and enjoying it more than ever. Thank you for podcasting your excellent analysis. The question you posed in episode 23 about where the rabbit flood legend came from caught my particular attention. According to researcher Philip Freund in his book Myths of Creation, there are over 500 flood legends told by more than 250 tribes and peoples. Richard Adams may not have been aware of that, but it does provide a great in-universe explanation. The rabbits did not need access to the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Judeo-Christian narrative, as if the flood legend were only some obscure story belonging to two or three human traditions. Instead, the conceit of the novel that rabbits would have their own flood legend could arise from the fact that if virtually every human culture on earth has a legend, why not rabbits? After all, the rabbit ancestors would have been survivors of the great event, the same event as the human survivors, and like the humans, anthropomorphic rabbits of that ancient past would have certainly passed down memories of such a cataclysm to their descendants as part of their tradition, which is exactly what has occurred with human cultures and societies around the world, all of whom have a legend of a global flood, even though such cultures and societies are historically and geographically isolated from one another and share no other common myths. Since the flood tradition is shared worldwide by humans who had no contact with one another, it's not really a stretch to imagine rabbits linguistically isolated from humans, yet survivors of the same event also possessing the tradition. Anyway, just a thought. Thank you again for helping me to fall in love all over again with this masterpiece of a novel. End quote. <clears throat> Some interesting thoughts on Lapine mythology, Tom, and a point well made. He also commented in response to my asking if I could read out his comments, Quote, another thing I wanted to mention that I've enjoyed about your podcast is learning about the extent of the fandom. Since there seems to be quite a hunger for anthropomorphic animal epics, I'm surprised there haven't been more of a genre developed around it. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings launched modern fantasy, but Warship Down never had a similar effect in its niche, not that other animal epics were never published. Perhaps it's because of the tendency to consider books with anthropomorphic character a- a- animal characters as, quote, only children's literature. I replied to that point by saying, absolutely right. Other genres have suffered the same prejudice, in my opinion. Comics and thinking about it science fiction in general, for example. Books such as Warship Down appeal, I think, because they actually deal with very human themes only at a remove. But the reader has to be prepared to suspend disbelief in much the same way as children easily do. This seems to be a challenge for many adults, end quote. To which Tom responded, quote, I think you summarise the problem quite well and would have to agree that it comes down to those two core issues, generalised prejudice against the genre and the inability to suspend disbelief. Suspension of disbelief is, I would argue, a crucial literary skill, something kids excel in. End quote. Thank you, Tom, for your thoughts. This was a really interesting exchange. Anyway, on to chapter 36. Chapter 36. Approaching Thunder. The quotation at the start of the chapter is from a British music hall song, probably 19th century in origin. It has no more sophistication than being about not bothering to scarper or escape because someone turns up who makes doing so a bad idea. Music hall wasn't known for the sophistication of its ideas. This is a fairly short chapter, but one in which a lot happens. Bigwig is now a member of the Owlsler of Ephrafa and he's got things to do. This is the first of the three Thunder chapters, in which the weather and the escape from Ephraim are parallel one another. These tap- chapters have dual meanings. It is impressive that Adam thought of things like this, and is one of the many things that make this book so special. Right in the beginning, Bigwig is woken up for duty by Avons, a reminder of the structure of Ephraim, and that the rabbits in the Owsler tend to follow this structure. Rather than just linking up somewhere, it seems that the Owsler must make, first make sure they're all ready to go. 
If so, this is smart, but also, but also oppressive. We learn, at least in moments of stress, that Bigwig talks in his sleep, and mention Fiverr by name. It is a tense moment, but no more comes of it, and the conversation between him and Avons quickly takes another tone. The weather seems a more up-to-the-moment topic. Unless the weather has actually turned bad, there's no sense in trying to deviate from Ephraf and Ways. Thundery weather is approaching, but Cherville thinks it will be some time before it breaks. When Bigwig is together with both Avons and Cherville, Avons makes a somewhat backhanded comment about Bigwig having to be woken up. Bigwig is then questioned about Heisenthal being in his burrow during the previous evening. Again, Bigwig passes things off. During this conversation, we also learn the Lapine word for a doe, Marley, as Heisenthal is described as the Mardi Tharn, a term Adams translates in this context as meaning forlorn maiden. Once he's outside, Bigwig immediately takes to looking at the terrain, routes to take, how to get Blackavar out, and he wonders if he is in a place where Kihar can observe him. Bigwig certainly has, present, has a presence of mind. As it turns out, Kihar is already on station and was ready to see Bigwig at the earliest opportunity. Good old Kihar. Thick as thieves, they work their way towards one another. This is like two soldiers that know what to do and just immediately go about it as if it were rehearsed. Bigwig and Kihar have an effective exchange. Bigwig can now relay instructions of their still-developing plan, and all of these modifications are Bigwig's. He tells Kihar that they will escape at Silfle that evening. Bigwig will lead the does to the archway on the Iron Road, where he wants to meet up with the watership down rabbits. He also gives Kihar clear instructions about attacking the sentries as soon as he sees Bigwig go back underground. This, we know, will be to rescue Blackavar. Soon, Cherville heads their way and Kihar flies away. Bigwig must once again play his espionage role. He tells Cherville that, no, he's not afraid of birds like this, and then cuts Cherville as a part of his answer why. An amazing thing for a rabbit to do to his Owsler captain, but this is big week that we are talking about. Cherville makes it clear that this little incident with the white word will be reported, and he leaves Bigwig and Avons to handle the mark. Between this and Avon's backhanded comment, this Warren has a deliberate Gestapo feel to it that Adams must have intended. Bigwig is able to get over to Heisenslay and Thethuthinang and provides updates. Following up his instruction to Kihar about attacking the sentries, with one to them to run as soon as they see him bring back Lavar out, as the sentries will be running for cover. He shows them the distant railway arch and reassures them of his ability to deal with Captain Campion, should they meet him. The Mark go back inside, and Blackavar is also taken under underground. Bigwig gets around the Warren and once again shows his presence of mind by asking Cherville if it's okay to visit another Mark. His presence of mind is really that he quickly understands and somewhat adapts to his operating environment. The operating environment is simply where a soldier finds him herself understanding things like the mission, physical layout, rules, procedures and acts accordingly. He does just this. He listens to officers of the left flank Mark and sees that in this area this group shares a larger single burrow. He departs after hearing some stories, goes back to his burrow, and rests until it's time to Silflay again. Bigwig sees Heisenthal and Thethuthinang go above ground, sees Blackavar, and also observes Kihar flying. Everything is in place. And then, just as he's ready to start the escape, he hears a voice behind him. It is General Woundwort, who wants a word with him. Next time, Bigwig has some explaining to do, and must rapidly plan on the spot, and communication becomes a huge issue. <laughs>